Look at you beautiful people. There's no one in the front row proving my theory that people truly fear powerful women. Uh, where are y'all? You're so far away. I welcome you to sit in the front, but it's okay if you don't. Uh, I'm Eddie Shmikati. I'm the Managing Director of Culture Change at an organization called Pillars Fund. We are a community-based grant-making organization that seeks to amplify the leadership, narratives, and talents of Muslims in the United States and the UK. Because we believe deeply that storytelling is one of the most powerful tools we have to transform our world. It offers each of us a mirror where we can see ourselves and a window where we can imagine the worlds beyond ourselves. Our signature program at Pillars in the Culture Change Arm is our Pillars Artist Fellowship, a program in partnership with Netflix, Amazon Studios, and Oscar winner Riz Ahmed that supports emerging Muslim screenwriters and directors to reach their greatest creative aspirations. And that's why we're so excited to be here with all of you tonight and our partners and collaborators to talk about why and how comedy matters. But before we get to that, it's one of my personal strongest beliefs that marginalized folks deserve frivolity. We deserve to laugh. So what better way to kick this thing off than with a little comedy set by one of the funniest human beings I know. I'm super excited to introduce her. Yasmin Al-Hadi is a comedian, an attorney, whatever, she's super lazy, uh, who has toured nationally and internationally. She's performed at the Kennedy Center and was featured on NBC's True Story with Ed Helms and Randall Park in 2022. She's also appeared locally on WUSA 9 with Reese Waters, NPR, Netflix is a joke, radio on Sirius XM, and the Washington Post. Pretty impressive. She was also named a 2022 Yes and Laughter Lab finalist for comedy and social justice. And most importantly to me, she is one of the most loyal and wonderful friends I've ever had the privilege to have. So please welcome Yasmin Al Hadi. Thank you, Reed. The check's in the mail. <laughs> Hi, everybody. I want to first start by saying that I am one of the good ones. <laughs> you know what I mean by that. <laughs> I have a security clearance, I check out. <laughs> I'm half Egyptian, half Libyan. <laughs> Hold the applause, please. please. Uh, I'm an asylum seeker in this country, um, and I just wanna first start off by saying that uh, this is not English. <laughs> You're like, oh my God, what does your purse say? What does it say? And I'm like, it obviously says death to America. <laughs> They're like, oh, what? I'm like, chill, it says Satan. I'll take it off for now. Just my name, Yasmin. Yeah, I know. Just my name. Just my name in Arabic. So I remember my worth um, when everyone else forgets it. So I'm an asylum seeker in this country. Uh, and my dad was kind of like a teeny tiny, a tad bit like a in the Gaddafi regime. Right? Like, what does that taste like? Is that cumin? No, it's tyranny. <laughs> That's dictatorship. <laughs> so my dad was a cabinet minister in the Gaddafi regime. Not low-key, high-key. Yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> Cringe, awkward, I know. But if you could just stay with me, we're on the right side of history. I told him I'm an asylum seeker, so my dad morally abstained against the Gaddafi regime and then moved to six countries to get to the freedom and safety of these United States. Yes. yes. America! Yes. And then uh, my parents took me to where it makes sense if you're looking for freedom and safety in the United States. A place that is very open to Muslims and Arabs, Alabama. That is where I grew up. It's also the sound of my soul um, when I wanted to unsubscribe from that movie. So if you wanna know why I sound like a white woman from Connecticut, it's because she taught me English as a second language. Thank you, Miss Mooney, the Yankee. But when I'm down there, I just turn it right on. It's no big deal, you know? Sometimes I'll just mess with people. I'll call Domino's. Hey, hey, Domino's. Just want a three-topping pizza, okay? <laughs> and then they come to the door and they're like, <gasps> bless your heart. <laughs> Blink twice if you want me to save you, sweetie. <laughs> I'm like, I'm not one of you. I just play one on the phone. Give me this pizza. <laughs> so when we first came uh, to the US, 
My parents were broke. Uh, they were just trying to make ends meet, and they knew I needed to learn English fast because of the Alabama thing that they did to me. So <laughs> they put me in um, like the free ESL. Have you guys heard of it? It's called the USA Network. <laughs> My parents put me in front of the USA Network because they thought I'd learn English faster. They were like, red, white, blue, do you, boo, go, go. I was a sixth of six kids, so by the time they got to me, they were like, raise yourself, we're so tired. <laughs> Every morning at seven in the morning, it was WWF wrestling with the greats, okay? Give it up for Hulk Hogan, <laughs> Randy Savage, Bret the Hitman Hart, even The Undertaker, a little goth, but he didn't have the love of his mother, so I could relate. <laughs> oh my God, every morning I was hopped up, ready to get on the bus. I was like, mama, get me on the bus. She was like, reduce, reduce. Just please minimize, we just made it to America. Don't mess this up, huh? Every single time I do make too many, act, too many moves, she's like, stop dancing for the money on stage. I'm like, that's not what I'm, that is not what I'm doing, mom. <laughs> so I'm like, I know how I'm gonna connect as a kindergartner, just get me to school. I know how to be an American. She's like, please don't embarrass me. You do it a lot. She's very judgmental, it's adorable. It's your cute vice, anyways. So I got on the bus and I got to kindergarten and there was a cute little girl there named Teresa. So I did what was natural, I wanted to connect. I got on top of the desk and I body slammed her to the floor. <laughs> and poor Teresa was like, why, Yasmin, why? I was like, I don't know, I can't hear you. Oh yeah. <laughs> I was sent to the principal's office where I was promptly diagnosed with ADHD. And they just kept me going because it's Alabama. They were like, oh my God, you're someone else's little problem. Keep going, you're doing so good, yeah. Until third grade came around and uh, my teacher, she was like, ugh, you need to get your daddy in here. You're a nuisance. I was like, I am not a new student. She's like, mm-hmm, get your daddy in here. You, you better listen, okay? PTA requests him. So I went home and I told my dad, who at that time was working two jobs, I was like, Baba, look, um, the PTA needs you to come to school. He's like, PTA? PTA? Is this a disease that the kids are getting at school? We don't want PTA, HPV, AID, HIV, we don't want it. No, Dad, it's the Parent Teacher Association. If you could just please conform, that would be good. All the other white parents are doing it. He was like, who said I had to be there? I'm like, no, no one said you had to be there. He's like, you're gonna owe me. I'm like, okay, I'm eight. I will work on it, I will. So he's like, fine. But my dad, his big thing was he tried to make me like proud of who I was. He'd always be like, just do it, be unique, do the right thing, just do it. I'm like, that's a Nike ad, Baba. He's like, yeah, but sometimes corporate gets it right. And I was like, I can't be unique right now. I just need you to come to school. So he shows up and then there's Miss Charney. She's looking at him, she's like, Mr. Um, <laughs> Mahunid, Mahunadudid, Maimonides, uh, Mayonnaise, Muhammad, whatever, sir, it does not even matter. Your daughter, Yasmine El Hudi and the Blowfish, she, <laughs> she is a real joy, she is. But she's also a challenge, isn't she? She just talk, talk, talks, has lots of opinions, asks a lot of questions, he's like, wait, wait, lady, is this a problem for the women in your country? <laughs> Where I am from, the women have lots of opinions. They ask a lot of questions. When I don't know something, I just nod like this. <laughs> She's like, Mr. Magoo, I don't think you understand. She is a real nuisance. And he looked there and he goes. <laughs> She's not new student, no. <laughs> Sir, I think she has ADHD and you, you might as well. And I, oh, I think she needs to be medicated. He looks at her, he's like, look lady, you mentioned a lot of letters. <laughs> What are her grades like? She's like, they're straight A, sir. That is not the point. He's like, no, no, that's the entire point. <laughs> then he got really low so I can make eye contact with him. He's like, I swear to God, if you waste my time with these white people ever again, <laughs> there are gonna be a lot of Caucasians in your way. Just do it, be unique, just do it. <laughs> Step over them. I was like, okay, that's really good. That's good advice, dad, thanks. Uh, my dad has a sixth sense of humor because um, of the Gaddafi thing. Uh, so... <laughs> <laughs> Right? <laughs> so I, I married a man from Afghanistan because I didn't have enough trouble in my life. Right? I need more trials. I was like, Arab in Alabama, I need another A, Afghanistan. It's a triple A rating in my house, okay? The kids are a quarter Egyptian, a quarter Libyan, and a half Afghan, which I endearly call them Afghan. 
we'll call their blood volume, we'll call it Freedom Fighter, it's fine. Um, it's a lot. <laughs> my dad jokes around, he's like, hey, I know they're acting crazy. They're a little bit Gaddafi, a little bit Taliban, eh? <laughs> no, actually, you can't say that about your grandson, dad, at the airport. <laughs> Trying to board. They were born knocked down, don't keep knocking them down. Kids are a lot, the kids are a lot. Uh, I've got ADHD, it's my cute vice. Um, and when you have kids, you know, they, they kind of, they're like a mirror to who you are, right? Like when you're in a relationship, that's a mirror to you as well. Like all your insecurities, all your flaws, which you quickly deflect onto the other person, right? <laughs> like I don't hate, I hate you. Actually, you hate, you hate yourself. But with your kids, there's no running away. Like if you have a problem with it, it's you. That's you staring at you. So my kids are flinging themselves off of the furniture. And, but my dad has become a softie in his old age. He's like, don't touch him. I'm like, Dad, I have to catch him. He's like, no, 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 don't break his spirit. <laughs> like, Dad, I have to break his fall. He's gonna break his skull. He's like, no, no, he will learn. He's become all woke. He's like, don't even raise your voice at him. Don't say a negative word. It will psychologically damage him. I'm like, yeah, I know. Uh, my kids, I told you their blood volume is pure evil. Uh, they, they were born pretty white passing. Can't lie, it pissed me off. <laughs> to answer your question, yeah, I look like this, but in Alabama, okay? So you think I was bullied a little bit? I have some scars. So imagine, here are these two kids in my house just staring at me. It's like having your oppressors at home. <laughs> staring at you with their beady little privileged eyes. <laughs> Don't worry. When my son turned two, the little guy, he browned up like a rotisserie chicken. <laughs> like the melanin kicked in, the Afghanistan part just really came to. Like an Ariana Grande before and after, but natural. <laughs> that's, that's a messed up joke. I like her. <laughs> I do, I like her. Thank you. Thank you. So, I mean, I'm, tr I'm trying to raise them in DC, that's where I'm based, uh, where there's a lot of respect for diversity and money. Um, so I feel like they'll, right? Yeah, I feel like they'll be okay. People are like, oh my God, what language do your kids speak? They're like the United Nations. I'm like, I don't know, something useful, probably Mandarin. World domination language, that's what they are gonna speak. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So the other day, uh, I, was, I was thinking about how different we're being raised. So I was raised in a, a completely different situation. My parents, by the way, still live in Huntsville, Alabama, guys. Yeah, and I'm like, why? And my mom was like, the judgmental one, she's like, you're so dumb. <laughs> like, mom, what are you talking about? She's like, I don't know, you're not as smart as me. I don't know how to say it. <laughs> I'm like, mom, how do you survive in Alabama? She gets stopped by the police all the time, by the way, because she's gorgeous. Cause she has like a teeny tiny bit of, of road rage. <laughs> yeah, he taught her it was this finger so she didn't get arrested, but it, it's surprisingly, shockingly crazy how many times she gets stopped. I'm like, mom, how do you get out of it every time? She's like, it's so simple. When the police come by, they say, ma'am, and I just say, no hable inglés, ese. <laughs> mom, no one believes that you speak Spanish. She's like, it's fine, voulez-vous coucher avec moi ce soir? <laughs> Works like a charm. So I tried it. So during the Trump years, I got stopped seven times in six months in Virginia. I had never had a ticket before. Coincidence? I think not. And I got stopped and they were gonna suspend my license. And the cop stops me and I just started making noises because I thought I couldn't do an offensive accent, right? So he, he stopped me, he's like, ma'am, do you know why I stopped you? And I was like, uh, 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 uh. Uh, and he's like, are you having a seizure, ma'am? I'm like, no, 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 sir. It's just really hard to drive. Should I even be driving? I'm just a little girl. He's like, ma'am, what do you do for a living? I was like, I'm a lawyer. <laughs> and then he asked me, he's like, what do you think about President Trump? I was like, is there an option to just simply get the ticket, sir, and avoid the just, Can I get your badge number? So my mom has been really amazing at sniffing out the races. She's really good at it. She just does not engage, okay? Or pretends like she can't speak English, which is pretty creative. And so we were in 
a Tyson's Virginia Marshalls. This is a real story. Right after Trump was elected, about a year in, and this woman comes up to us with a name tag. Pretty official. My mom beelines it away from me as quick as possible. So I should have, I should have known. This woman's like, hi, hey, hi, my name is Jill. I work here. What are you, what are you doing? How can I help you? I'm like, I'm just getting some black and brown boots. No big deal. Thank you. And she's like, mm, black and brown boots. Mm. Who'd you vote for? <laughs> I was like, oh, I don't, I'm so sorry. It's like a privacy poll thing, booth thing. I don't talk to strangers about that. I'm going to get these boots and skedaddle. And she's like, I, I voted for Trump. I was like, oh, that's cool. That's awesome. And I could see my mom looking at me through the clothing rack like, it's stupid. It's stupid. <laughs> she was like, I just feel like he's protecting the Constitution. He just really cares about America. He's putting America first. He's making it great again. And I was like, cool. I'm just going to get these boots and not talk to you again. Okay. And she was like, well, I just think there's too many Muslims here, don't you? I was like, well, Jill. <laughs> I'm actually w one of them, so I would have to patently disagree with you about too many Muslims things. She's like, no, no, you're not one of them. I was like, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I, I'm, I'm definitely Muslim. She's like, no, you're not as deep as them. It's like, what do you mean? I'm not as philosophical as other Muslims. Like, I can't discuss Tolstoy or poetry. Yeah, I'm not very smart. Is that what you mean? What does this mean? She's like, no, no, you're not as deep as them. And then she winked at me and pointed to her face. I was like, are you saying that I'm not black enough to be Muslim? And she was like, exactly what you said. And in that moment, I was like, shit, I have white privilege. <laughs> Only my friends in Alabama could see me now. Thank you, everyone. My name is Yasmin Alhadi. That was awesome, wasn't it? Thank you so much, Yasmin. Um, so hello, everyone. Thanks so much for being here. Um, I think I'm kind of the palate cleanser between the two main courses, so I'm going to make this as quick as possible. Um, my name is Jen Humke, and I am with the Journalism and Media Program at the MacArthur Foundation. And um, we support many of the people that you're going to see on stage today. We're very proud supporters of them. And I also wanted to be up here just to welcome you uh, to the event this evening because this is the first uh, public event that we are holding in Chicago since pre-COVID. So it's kind of a new experience for us. So thank you for being here. And when I say us, I mean the MacArthur Foundation, of course. Um, so very quickly, for those of you who don't know the MacArthur Foundation, we are a global grant-making institution and we are headquartered here in Chicago. We make grants totaling about $250, $250 million, excuse me, <laughs> um, to organizations all around the globe working on a range of issues. Um, and we fund them you know, to help make the world a better place, to make it more peaceful, to make it more inclusive, to make it more equitable. Um, the journalism and media program, of which I am part, and which is bringing you today's event, is national in scope. And we support groups and activities across the country working to strengthen our democracy by ensuring that everyone has access to accurate, incredible, and dependable information and knowledge. And that all of us have a voice in our democracy and all of us have the ability to influence and shape our culture, shape the institutions and the policies that govern us. And believe it or not, comedy is actually part of that. Um, I also want to give a round of thanks to a number of people, so please bear with me. First of all, I want to thank the Pillars Fund and Second City for co-hosting this event with us. I couldn't think of better partners for this. A special thank you to Arij and her colleagues Kalia and Kashif, who weren't able to make it this evening, but please send them my regards. Um, I also want to thank Kelly and Kelly, so two Kellys from Second City, female Kelly and male Kelly, um, for making it possible for us to host this event in this amazing space. So thank you, Second City. And I also want to thank my colleagues at MacArthur that made tonight happen, and they made it look 
really easy and seamless, and I know they did a lot of hard work behind the scenes. And that's Beth Basta, Michael Venegas, Shane Perdue, Stephen Hildebrand, and Sean Harder. So thank you to them. I would also be remiss if I didn't introduce you to, to two of my co-conspirators at the MacArthur Foundation and the Journalism and Media Program. Kathy M, who is our director. I can't see anyone the lights, but I know she's here, she's over there. And Lauren Pabst, who is a senior program officer in the Journalism and Media Program. So, huge thanks to them. And finally, I have the really great pleasure of introducing our moderator tonight, <clears throat> Mr. Kelly Leonard. And I know in this room he barely requires an introduction, um, but he, I'm gonna do it anyway. <laughs> Um, he is currently Vice President of Creative Strategy, Innovation, and Business Development here at Second City. He started his career here at Second City in 1988, eventually becoming producer, and then uh, after that, Executive Vice President, and he served in that position through 2015. He has produced hundreds of original reviews with talent such as Stephen Colbert, Tina Fey, Keegan-Michael Key, Seth Meyers and Amy Poehler. So, you know, no big deal, right? Um, he also co-leads a new partnership with the Booth School at the University of Chicago that studies behavioral science through the lens of improvisation. In 2015, he published a book called Yes And, which received rave reviews from Vanity Fair and Washington Post. He also hosts a podcast, which all of you should subscribe to if you don't already, called Getting to Yes And. I believe actually tonight's event is gonna eventually be um, broadcast via his, his podcast. And that podcast features conversations with visionary writers, thinkers, and doers who are using creativity to challenge conventional business approaches. So I think there is nobody better to be leading us in this conversation this evening about comedy and social change than Mr. Kelly Leonard. So please come out on stage. Thank you, Kelly. Hey everybody, welcome to Second City. How are y'all doing? Excellent. I don't know about left-wing audiences. I know, I mean, the, like, you know, we have a thing at Second City too, which is, it's, it's sometimes like the people who are doing the good sometimes don't laugh as hard, but this feels like a pretty, pretty good audience so far, so I mean, we're gonna go with it. All right, let me introduce our panel. Uh, Katie Borum is the Executive Director of the Center for Media and Social Impact at American University in Washington, D.C. She is the co-founder and director of the Yes And Laughter Lab and the author of many books, and most recently her book, The Revolution Will Be Hilarious. Katie, come on up. Your mic is in your seat, you can turn it on. Uh, Crystal Echo Hawk is the founder and executive director of Illuminative, the first and only national native-led organization focused on changing the narrative about native peoples on a mass scale. Crystal, come on out. And you've met Yasmin El Haidi. She is a comedian and attorney who has toured both nationally and internationally, and she currently works as the chief of staff to the director for the Executive Office of Immigration Review. It's an amazing group, right? All right. We will discuss many things, and I think what I want this to be, too, is, is free-flowing. So if you have ideas you want to jump on, you don't need to wait for me to cue. Though I do, Katie, want to start with you. So your, I think your origin story, so where you start in the industry, right, to the academic career, to the book that you've just written, I think sort of illustrates why we might be here today, right? Can you tell us about that? Yes, thank you, Kelly. Uh, hi, everyone, thank you so much for coming. How great was Yasmin? I mean, can you even believe, anyway. Um, I will start by saying, Kelly, that the last time, uh, I realized this on the way here, um, the last time I was in Chicago talking about a book, I was with you, yep. and I was also with the MacArthur Foundation, yep. and it was March 2020, and it was the beginning and end of my very first book tour. It was very yeah. sad. So I might be bad luck. 
I don't know. I'm so I don't, sorry. I don't, hear a, I don't hear a person in the fifth row coughing uncontrollably. Yes, that also happened. Which that happened, happened that night. right here in this building. Yep. Uh, Smaller room. Yes. So anyway, um, yeah, so that was in 2020. And so I wrote a new book, uh, The Revolution Will Be Hilarious, which tells a little bit more of the origin story, but I appreciate that start, and um, I think it connects to two of my favorite women who are sitting next to me, which is such a joy. Um, so I was a producer for the legendary Norman Lear for quite a while in Los Angeles. I was a producer and a philanthropy director, and what we were doing with that work was really leveraging the power of entertainment and comedy, of course, Anyone who doesn't know he is, you can Google him later, not now. Um, he's a legend. But um, he's sort of the progenitor of the idea that you can really interrogate public affairs issues and really what's going on in our lives that we might find too taboo to talk about, that you can incorporate that into television comedy and actually not sacrifice the humor and, and sort of have it be a spark of conversation. So we were leveraging that kind of work for all kinds of things namely voter engagement at the time. And so I always like to start with that because I think the DNA of Norman Lear and his great spirit and his imagination, and truly he's a guy that really doesn't think that anything is impossible, so also it's nice to be professionally socialized around someone like that. Um, so I like to say that my DNA in comedy like comes by me honestly. Um, but years later, so I've been working in media and social change as a scholar and as an activist, as a writer, as a filmmaker. I've basically done everything a person can do in the intersection of entertainment and social change. But years after those Norman years, I was again working on uh, yet another project that was trying to get people to think critically in, in this instance, it was a, a project about global development, the Millennium Development Goals. I don't know where the public health people are, but um, very sexy. Um, you know, the world's most wicked, terrible problems, uh, extreme poverty. And so the challenge at the time was, is there another storytelling mechanism by which we can get people to engage in issues that are inherently too dark and complicated to actually think about? And so, uh, very long story short, I produced a documentary, two-part series with Hassan Minaj before um, a second before he was famous, I like to say. <laughs> it's like he got The Daily Show like four months after our documentary came out. Um, but anyway, so this project was called Stand Up Planet and uh, basically the log line is, a uh, stand-up comedian uh, from the US goes in search of the funniest comedians in the developing world and follows their jokes into the social issues of their lives. And then um, I, what happened in that project was uh, I got a, a small grant to do a research project to actually understand how audiences might have engaged with that material differently when they were exposed to a comedic intervention compared to what we think of as sort of the traditional way to tell those stories. Um, long form journalistic, which by the way, yes to that also. I'm never saying these ideas are in competition. Um, and that study led to a huge research agenda. And I kind of sat back and I thought, there's so much that we're missing when we think about human rights work and social change work in entertainment. When we have decided, sort of en masse, that comedy is a little bit too scary or risky to think about when we think about engaging in dire social problems, I thought that was a mistake. Because we've always known that comedy is a source of catharsis and resilience and community building and representation and a way to show the, uh, our solidarity as fellow humans. But I realized that no one was going to believe me based on my sort of anecdotal feelings and my Norman Lear story um, to actually go, th you know, to support that proposition without research. So, we started a very big research agenda at the Center for Media and Social Impact that I'm so proud of. This, this journey has been um, actually 10 years since we started that documentary and did the research. And uh, it led to my first book called A Comedian and an Activist Walk Into a Bar. That's such a funny title. Um, it's really funny for academic publishing. Um, it's like hilarious. It crushes. Right, it, of course, it, crush, it totally crushes, right? It has a colon and then the other stuff is not funny. Um, 
And then uh, my new book is called The Revolution Will Be Hilarious, colon, comedy for social change and civic power. But here's the, the bottom line. I will stop here, Kelly, in case you're starting to panic. If you have panic in I'm your good. eyes, no, she's never going to stop talking. Um, why that's relevant to, I think, why we're all here and how we share this common thread together, and these are, of course, two ladies that I've worked with um, quite a bit, is um, in doing that research, what I realized very deeply, so the research was designed to ask and answer exactly how does comedy work for audiences and culturally when it comes to encouraging us to think about communities that have been dehumanized or misrepresented or sometimes not seen at all, how does comedy help us deal with issues that are taboo and painful and complicated? And so the research goes into all of that. But the most important piece of this, I think beyond uh, the fact that there are not books that help attempt to try to prove that point, is that uh, we really wanted to create models to actually bring comedians and human rights people together to actually co-create comedy once we knew how meaningful comedy is as a force for social change and equity and justice, why would we want to just hold that knowledge in books and articles? And so we launched a couple of things. Uh, one is called the Yes and Laughter Lab, which Yasmin uh, was a winner of last year, where we basically um, work with and attempt to leverage our own relationships to try to put more power in the hands of comedians who are telling brilliant lived experiences that we haven't seen as much because the entertainment industry has long had a problem. I don't know what um, you mean. What do you mean by that? Oh my God. You know what? I'm, no one wants me to talk longer, so I'm, everybody knows what I'm talking about. And, uh, and then we launched uh, another program, and the Yasin Laughter Lab is this incredible program that now is this network of comedians across the country who are doing really incredible comedy work and we um, build relationships and power with um, the entertainment industry and social justice groups and also a program called Good Laugh which we launched last year where we bring comedians and organizations together to co-create comedy together and one of those uh, first programs was with Crystal Echohawk who is a superstar social justice leader. I describe her as one of the most important indigenous leaders of our generation. Do you know I say that about you? No, but I know, but I'll pay you for that later on. Thanks. Okay, um, well, you'll buy me a drink. Um, <laughs> uh, anyway, and designed to co-create comedy for civic power and, and social justice. So um, it's a real honor to be here to be able to tell that story because the book tells the research, but the book also tells the stories about what happens when you actually leverage comedy in that way and don't sacrifice the humor. That's the most important thing that I want to say on the Second City stage, is that no one is trying to make crappy comedy that's not funny. Because it doesn't work. That's in the book. They're that's called right. TED Talks. Yeah. yeah, we had this conversation backstage. Uh, Peter McGraw, who is also an academic who studies comedy, uh, says that uh, people are interested in hot tea or cold tea. They don't want warm tea. And I think that's very true with regard to comedy. Crystal, okay, I was thinking about what I wanted to ask you first. So my wife, Anne, is a tenured professor of comedy. Uh, and when she is teaching some of the differences between stand-ups and improv comedians, for improv comedians, she talks about the fact that they do perspective taking. They take suggestions from the audience and create scenes. And what stand-up comics have to do uh, is especially in the first five minutes of their act to talk about perspective giving. So they have to teach the audience how to watch them. And often it is through the things and the struggles they've gone through. That's what you did. And I was interviewing Kevin Cruz on my podcast, who's a historian who has a terrific book called Myth America. And it's a bunch of essays about the various myths in America. And one of them is by a guy named Eric Kelman. And he starts it by quoting Rick Santorum, <laughs> Wow, we, we all know where this is going. Loaded question. Uh, who, who says, quote, we birthed a nation from nothing, end quote. Oh. <laughs> and I, I'm curious in terms of doing a bit of research on you, which storytelling is really important and being seen is really important. And it strikes me that, that in many ways, seeing through the comic lens is a little bit dangerous, very vulnerable 
and in so probably is why it's worth it. What do you think? Wow, there's a lot in there. Um, I mean, I'm happy, you know, I think one, and I'll back up, but um, I'm proud to say that Illuminative was part of the reason why Rick Santorum got fired from CNN over those very <laughs> Um, and it's one of the ways that we use comedy, right? I mean, you know, it was to, to see the, the, the glory of white supremacy roll off this man's tongue, right? Um, but then to see how CNN propped it up and just didn't apologize, right? Um, really underscored our invisibility that it didn't matter, right, what we said. Um, so we organized this huge campaign and in which we unleashed the native comedians, you know, on him and supporters and just really built up enough of a viral pressure point that I loved the day I got the call from a reporter at the Huffington Post breaking news that he had been fired and that, um, see, Illuminative's name was being taken in vain <laughs> in the corporate offices. So, um, but, you know, I think your, your question in terms of the, just kind of the vulnerability or, or the humor, the thing about native communities, and I, I are, like all communities, I mean, but Humor is so important to who we are, right? And because of everything that we've been through, I think it's the medicine, right, of how we constantly confront so many of the challenges, the, the trauma, the, the, all the things, right? That humi humor is just such an important part of who we are. It's so natural. And, um, and it's just been an incredible thing to watch increasingly as we've been fighting for more and more representation. To, you know, I think that Normally in the United States, it always has felt like we've only been given two choices, right? Either you're invisible, vanishing American, right? Or you're gonna show up how we are gonna define how you show up. Whether it's the kind of red-faced, you know, tear, ironized Cody who's ended up being fake Indian, um, you know, or we're gonna show up as a mascot or we're gonna show up in a certain way, right? Or we're gonna have to be the magical, mystical, native whatever, right? Um, and that is, so it's always, we've never been able to define ourselves, right? And so what's beautiful to see, particularly I think within, you know, for so long, but I think within the last, you know, five or six years is to see the rise of native comedians, right? And the way that, like the, now it's like we don't, we get to define ourselves and we're fucking funny, yeah. right? And we don't have to be what everyone else is defining us to be. And it's been so fascinating. I watched this amazing native comedian, Bobby, Bobby Wilson, get up and do stand up in front of all these executives at NBC Universal. And this was back in 2018. He was hilarious, but we were also terrified. And you, the audience, it took a minute like, oh gosh, this native person standing up on the mic is not being tragic or not sitting here making it rain, or like whatever, <laughs> or talking to And everyone animals. was a little disappointed in that. Right, they were, and they were disappointed, right? And it, it took a minute, I think, even for audiences to be like, wow, but we've found, you know, that really it's, it's been so beautiful to watch Native people really, that's all, we're funny, and to watch now the rise of Native comedy and who has seen Reservation Dogs. I mean, it's, you know, and to see that that show, which is winning awards, it's a darling, it's all these things, but it's really through the lens of, of comedy. So I don't know if I'm totally answering your question, but it's, yeah. it's been one of, the, I think, the most powerful forces because we've seen dramatic changes in the advance of Native representation, you know, in media and entertainment and politics and a variety of, of different things. Um, and I think as I, I look at this moment, I just see this kind of increased like, embrace and, and more and more Native people saying, we're going we're gonna to be who we are and we're not afraid to make fun of ourselves. That's what I love about Reservation Dogs. Like when you watch it, we're all, they're also making fun of ourselves and everybody else and it's a, it's a beautiful, powerful thing. So. Yeah, that, that's an incredible way to gain power and claim it. Uh, yes, I mean, I don't know if you remember this article. You were asked to briefly describe your worst gig. <laughs> Uh huh. <laughs> and it relates to my comment, which fell a little flat when we came out uh, about the crowd. Yeah. So can you do you was remember a, this? A, a Jewish retirement home? No, no, it was not. No. Okay, because that one was pretty bad. I can I can read I can read your quote. They just fell asleep. Yeah, go ahead. It's not their fault. They're this is what this is what you said about this one. You said, "Oh man, a gig with a bunch of male Muslim scholars in the first three oh, rows." Oh, that was the worst. <laughs> Oh they God. all were simply trying yes. to avoid yeah. eye contact. Yes. <laughs> yeah, that was 45 minutes of bombing. Um, straight bombing. I was like, I'm contractually obligated to be here. 
Oh, man. But yes. this, this is a thing. I, I mean, honestly, there's a lot of audiences, yeah. well-meaning, yeah. who really like to get offended on the behalf of others. <laughs> <laughs> or pretend like you don't exist. Well, that would, yes, right? that would be another one. Like, if I just don't look at her, she'll go away. Mm-hmm. Or if I don't look at her, she's not there. Um, yeah, okay, that's a negative, that's a negative foot to, to start on. But, um, yeah, I, you know, the, the, the amazing thing about doing comedy over and over and over again is that you get really good at just doing your job and being a professional at it and just being like, you know what, if it's a lot of laughter or zero laughter, Let's be committed to the role. Um, yeah, that was a that was a that was a particularly demoralizing event in my life. Now that I think about it, I'm so glad I brought it up. Yeah. Um, oh, it was so bad. But, but here's my question for it's you. Like my, it was like my parents in the front row. You know, right. like will this go away if I just don't look at her? Yeah. I'm just but there's a bit of a chicken and egg thing, I think, just with kidding. regard to this, which I'm curious. Yes. Which is you don't succeed at stand-up comedy without bombing so true over and over again so it creates resilience yes so i'm like it's sort of like what came first yeah right? yeah yeah definitely the failure uh for first. sure yeah. for sure comes first there and then i think the resilience so the resilience part of it is being a professional knowing how to do your job in any kind of certain circumstance but i think also like the the practice of bombing as a comedian is how your material is stronger and tighter so that you don't have you know you know like the, the dead air the dead space you know you're, you're trying to get every nine seconds you're trying to get a laugh in you know if your writing is tight or not if you have superfluous but then sometimes your writing is good and they just suck they don't want to give you anything and and the thing about like for me i started off really as a comedic storyteller <laughs> i i just did like a little talent show at my grad school and then I like won the talent show but I was doing pictures I was like doing like stories about my life but no one thought it was real and they saw the picture like holy crap that's real I'm like yeah that's my dad and he's slaughtering this animal you know it was like intense it was intense you know and uh, they were like you're what you guys are hippies in Alabama yeah but from the desert yes so it was a lot to unpack and then people were like is this real so once I did that I realized oh like maybe I you know maybe I have something here but when you first start off that that exchange that energy exchange between you and the audience is very important but the, the more you advance in your career in the comedy world it doesn't matter what the audience is doing or not doing you have to go in there and do your job of course there's like brilliant crowd work which I always would love to do you know and those that's like a fun improvisational part of being um, a stand-up it's like kind of where like those two sort of meet but and then I like I really love exploring that but when you're doing a gig like at Second City you've got you know your 12 minutes and you gotta you know you gotta deliver and it doesn't matter what the crowd is doing or not so anyways um, just to say I would like to just say that my parents are actually supportive of the comedy thing only because I bought my passion. And what I mean by that is, I have a real job, everybody, with a 401k and a health plan, right? I've got the two kids, they're like, you wanna live your life backwards, that's your choice. (laughs) You know what I mean? They're like, you have five degrees, oh, you wanna be a clown on stage, oh, I'm a clown, that's fine, that's fine. That's okay, that's okay, it's on you. I think I, I mentioned this backstage. I think my, my son quit his corporate job to be an actor full time, and I said to him, you know, I'm a, I feel a little bad that your mom and I gave you the illusion you could make a living in this field. <laughs> I love that. And he goes, don't think I haven't thought about that. <laughs> all right, um, I want, this is for all of you. Um, um, w- when I'm talking about improvisation and the power of improvisation, when I do my keynotes, a lot of times I say um, this quote, and it comes from near IL, who's a technologist, and um, he said, if it can't be used for evil, it's not a superpower. So I want to talk about storytelling. And and my point in, like, I think storytelling, we all think, is incredibly powerful. It's how how people learn. Um, But I do get a little frustrated, which is, like, everyone in the world says they're a storyteller now. And you could be working in any position. I'm waiting for, like, my heart doctor to go, you know, really, I'm a storyteller. (laughs) And and so so that annoys me. Um, However... Um, it is absolutely true in, in the sense of this is how people learn and this is how we get people to back us and all that. Um, and so I want to talk about this notion around civic power and what it means for civic storytelling. Mm-hmm. 
And any of you can pick this up and let's sort of play with this concept. And you can tell a story if you need to. Um, I'm happy to start. Um, but I, I, I wanted to say something that Yasmin said that was so important is the idea of failure and not resting until you get it right, till you reach the audience. That's actually one of the hidden pieces when we think about comedy and social change work and public engagement. Because I think for a very long time, and I feel like I can say this because I really have been doing this work of trying to leverage entertainment for social change for 20 years, and there's this kind of mythology that if we just give people all the information, surely we will behave differently. Um, sadly... I don't know if you noticed. That is not how no. humans operate, right? So there's a kind of well-meaning arrogance in that idea that we'll just give people the facts and the information. And by the way, I'm pro-facts. <laughs> I am pro-facts and pro-real information. That's not what I'm Alternative saying. facts is what I like. I know, yes. My own facts. Yes, oh, your own facts. So, um, but, uh, but, the, but the idea that you can just sort of like put it out there and that you've done your job, it's much, much harder to reach people in ways that touch their emotional selves and their heart. It's much harder to do that. So there is also something about a comedian's practice, not just what they've just, not just what Yasmin has just done for you, but everything that it took for her to make all of that work for months and months to figure out how she was gonna reach you, how she was gonna reach different audiences. You maybe never reached that one first group, but, yeah. um, no. but think about how hard that was, right? It wasn't, it wasn't like, oh, here are the jokes and you know, you're gonna take it or leave it. So I, there's something about the creative practice and the artistic practice of really creating comedy that also really belongs in spaces for, um, for, for entertainment that desires to be, you know, capturing people. Um, okay, civic power. Who wants to know what the hell that means? Mm -hmm. Some people. Um, great, okay, a few hands, that's perfect. Um, so civic power is the idea that uh, our, our democratic system, beyond what we think of as you know, for, for many years, there's a lot of scholarship in my field, media and communication, that sort of holds out voting as the one and only way that we show our civic engagement. That's such a um, disappointing, unidimensional way to think about civic practice. Uh, the idea of civic power is the idea that we must believe at some really fundamental level that our collective mobilized voices are meaningful in creating the culture and the democratic system that we want to believe in. That is, for public health people, also efficacy. If we don't genuinely believe that we can do something about our own systems, and that if we do, it will be meaningful, if we don't genuinely believe that, we actually don't do anything. And so when entire communities and lived experiences are not seen in cultural landscapes, it's very difficult to imagine that one's voice does matter, right? Yes. So civic power, when it comes to comedy, it, civic power is created at least in part, in great part, if you ask people like Crystal and I, who work a lot in culture and narrative, created in great part by the narratives that we see in our entertainment system and in our culture, that we learn to believe in who is worth paying attention to, who are our heroes, who are our villains, who is worthy of our respect and our kindness and our empathy, all of that is in entertainment culture. And comedy gets to play, if you ask me, the most special role of all. And you know why? I'm gonna be very reductive for one second. Because often when we don't see entire communities and lived experiences, when we do, or social problems, when we do see them, they might be reduced to, as Crystal mentioned, hero or villain. And even the well-meaning hero is itself dehumanizing. Because all of us are a mess. We are flawed, we are trying to survive, yes. we are taking care of our kids and our teenagers, holy crap. 
So we're all trying to do that so we can see each other and find solidarity and thus caring when we see each other in our shared, flawed humanity. That's solidarity. That's not empathy, I feel bad for you. Solidarity is, holy crap, looks like we're similar. Right? So that's where, because comedy can cut through those kinds of narratives when it's used in the best possible ways and do that work. And going back to the ripple effect of civic power, that is powerful when we see and know one another in that way. And I, I'm, I'm, one of the things that Crystal mentioned, but she can tell it much better than I can, is a really, there is a chapter about Crystal in my book. So if you want to know her part of her story, it's in my book. Um, you could also ask her, but also you could read chapter six. Uh, Find the book. But you could also ask her. Um, but one of the amazing things that I think brings this to life is uh, about the show Reservation Dogs, which is about teens living on the res, is how many um, young people living on reservations started to create podcasts and YouTube videos talking about which characters they were like. That's such a beautiful byproduct participatory culture and a way of maybe not saying, I see and feel that civic power, but a way of saying, I feel seen and celebrated, and also we're, we're able to be funny. Yeah. That's incredible, right? That's, so anyway, civic power. Crystal, do you have <laughs> Who loves it? Crystal, do you have more to add on to that, that in terms of? Power. I'm obsessed with it. In terms of talking about where storytelling sort of started with you in terms of understanding how it could be used in this in this way i want it <laughs> um, <laughs> you are so good um, yeah i mean for me like i think my great teachers in storytelling were does anybody know who the zapatistas are yeah. um yeah i worked for the zapatistas not a lot of people know that um but yeah, it's in, oh yeah, it's in the book. I know all of my staff read it and they're like, what the hell, who's our boss? Um, no, but just like, I think that was the, for me, the true initial intersection when you're talking about the power of civic power in storytelling. And, you know, beautiful communiques that would be written by Subcomandante Marcos and like the different Zapatista leadership. And they were fables and they were stories and there were humor, and, but they also always dealt with neoliberalism and, and you know, the inequities and the things that were happening. But it really was a, a different way and that was the beauty of the movement. You know, and I was a just 25 year old gal coming on up that I like really began to learn the power of, of, of that story, right? Um, in, in terms of kind of moving people's hearts and minds, you know? And when we think oftentimes like social justice initially when I came up was like hardcore and activism and you kind of just talk at people and you yell and you organize and it's resisting and it's, and what I really found through that power of, of story and that, that chapter in my life was really about beauty and joy and creation and humor and how that's just as powerful as that kind of resistance sort of hard language that we, we use and to see that through the, the, their storytelling techniques with that inter, intersecting with that organizing and that civic power, it became a global movement. And it was extraordinary to come up in that. And I think that was really the foundations if anybody kind of now looks at the work we do at Illuminative, right? Because we are so invisible. 80% of Americans don't know anything about us and depending on where you live in this country, people aren't even sure if we exist. That's what our research found. That's what we're up against. So we gotta get damn creative, right? And, and because people just, and, and people are so ingrained, like I was saying earlier, that they just wanna put us in these pigeonholes. Either you're the magical, mystical Indian, right? You know, or you're, you've gotta be a squaw, you gotta be like the over-sexualized, you know, native woman, you, you know, you've gotta be these things, or you gotta be a drunk, you know, and just a, a hot damn mess. And like, the, 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 the stereotypes are so rigid, right? So we have to get, really creative and so I think when I look at not only the work that we do but I look at all the the kind of social justice the organizing working that's happening in Indian country we are I see it more and more we have really embraced the fact that we are original storytellers that is that is such a part of our tradition doesn't matter what tribe you come from and the way that we are more and more using that to connect to people so that they do see us and they're not just they're finally cutting through the the, the stereotypes 
right? And that when we can you really use, whether it's, it's comedy or different ele storytelling elements, right, that we work into our campaigns, we see more and more that it's calling people in. And I think it's so important right now when we think about the importance of civic power, especially with everything that's going on in this country right now, um, that the power of that storytelling combined is so important now because we're so polarized. We're not hearing each other anymore. You know, so when we can use comedy, right, to kind of come in and, and find a different way to kind of initiate that conversation and then kind of pull somebody in to say, take action with us, it's a beautiful thing. I, I don't, it's so good. Yeah, man. She said all those good words, put them together, it was amazing. Um, I was just, all I was going to say is just, uh, I don't, I can't relate to the stereotype thing that you're yeah, talking about. I, I, yeah, I saw you kind of go. I just kind of went blank because I, I kind of start with a blank slate anyways, but um, <laughs> I just want to say that existence is resistance. Yeah. Just the existence. And, and, and when you're talking about civic power, you're talking about just so, knowing that you exist. Ooh, now you're, now, you're, now you're talking, right? Now you're talking. I, because I wear a headscarf, because I'm a Muslim woman that chooses to express herself in this way and has the right to and, and the privilege to be able to express myself in this way, because I can walk into a room and it speaks for me without me saying a word, there is a really beautiful thing about that. And then there's this like... Holy crap, you know, I'm in a box now. You're talking about the pigeonhole, right? Like, she's either not going to speak English correctly or she converted to Islam. That's a lot of people are like, so I, I was talking to a Baptist pastor at like an interfaith event. He was like, so when did you convert to this? Are you trying to piss off your parents? Is this a phase? And I was like, sir, this is, uh, it's rude. Uh, that's rude. Um, but but I, I was just going to say that uh, I, I did like a narrative workshop with Marshall Gantz and he talks a lot about using the power of narrative and story to advance civic power. He talks about the story of you, the story of us, and then the ask. And that's kind of like the paradigm in which you do a lot of activist storytelling. He also worked with the Zapatistas and has a, a long um, you know, history with that. Anyways, but I, I was just going to say with comedy, it's got to be funny. So I am telling the story of me, and then I'm telling the story of us because the more specific I get about my story, I'm gonna hit you. The more specific I get about what's going on in my life, suddenly we're gonna relate, whether you like it or not, because you're gonna see yourself in me. And the hope is that I also see myself in you, and that we can have an actual dialogue, which we're gonna do today. We're gonna have some questions from the audience. It's the best part. Um, but I, I know for me personally, I started comedy because of Trump. Because he just, he's adorable and has done so much good. Oh, I was worried you were going to be critical. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He's just mm, like so plush and orange, but mm, like, a little, like a little orange. So, you know, I, I, I was, I, I just did, I did a little interview before and he, he, he went on Anderson Cooper and Anderson Cooper was like, what do you think about Muslims? And he goes, Islam hates us. That's what I think. Like, what are you talking about? How can America, that's not even 300 years old, an infant, a, a, a toddler, not even like trying to walk, has something to say about a civilization that's over 1,400 years old? Mm. Like, what are you even talking about? Like, like, the, like the, 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 the lack of historicity in that comment. You know, I just made that shit up, but you know what I'm saying? <laughs> I did. If he's gonna make shit up, I'm gonna make shit up. You're my alternative facts. I was like, oh no, I gotta go exist somewhere on some stage. I gotta go exist because that's my form of resistance. And uh, I can story tell, I could do that uh, without the pictures, maybe it'll work. And it did, and one, literally one open mic to now. That's, that's you know, I haven't, I didn't go and sign up for, you know, people are like, hey, is this like, is that story real? I'm like, yeah, they're like, come here, just do it again. Do it again in front of a whole other group of people, so. Mm -hmm. It's very, very powerful because now my existence is, is, is shocking and expanding and relating and confusing and conversating and that's great. That's the turn that we want. We want that churn to think about what is possible. What is possible for a Muslim woman that looks like me? And what's so cool is now I, 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 just, I was in New York. I was, I was performing in New York. I was performing in New Jersey last weekend and this young woman comes up to me 
Her name is Sarah, and she, she started as a personal assistant at Saturday Night Live. And she's like, hey, I saw you at something in 2019, before the pandemic hit. I just want you to know, I, I, I want to do comedy. I was like, hell yeah, boo. It was amazing to see. And then it was like, yeah, we should be existing in those spaces. Now she's going to eclipse me, and I'm so excited to see it. Yeah. I, I really am. I, am ex I want the front row seats for Sarah's you know, comedy because that, yeah, baby, because that, I mean, that's what we're doing. I mean, that's why I'm doing it. I'm doing it to create civic power. And the way you do it is inspiring those that look like you and expanding the people that don't. Yeah, that's great. You know, I've, I've done a, I did a panel at the Chicago International Film Festival where we talked about why comedy and uh, mental illness, which is similar in terms of, of, of what we're talking about in the sense that I think people, because comedy in and of itself is normally incongruent, that is part of what makes it funny, something's incongruent, um, it's hard for people to, you know, latch on to like, oh, can you really make fun of this? And we all hate that question that comes, which is, what can you not make fun of? So please don't ask it. Um, but, I, but I think that um, uh, in, in understanding that, um, I mean, as F. Scott Fitzgerald said, the key to intelligence is holding two opposite ideas in your head at the same time, right? So I'm curious for, for, for you, has there ever been a moment in, with each of you where you have had that doubt of like, oh, does, it, does this belong here? Or did you, like for me at Second City, it was just the realization working here on staff back in the 80s and early 90s, night after night, and seeing the audiences get it or not get it or get it or not get it, and realizing, as I think we talked about, you talked about before, this idea of practice, you know, that, oh, no, 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 it's a practice, you have to do it like this. And, and the realization also that, you know, there's no joy without suffering. Yeah. I mean, the, the, that, it's just a fact of everything. So, so the fact is like, why, of course why not comedy? Because otherwise are we just gonna cry the whole time? I don't know, what do you think? There's no shadow without light. Yeah. Right, and there's no light without shadow. I know, someone smarter than me put those good <laughs> words together. <It's, laughs> a professor at Cambridge University, his name is TJ Winner. We know him as Abdul Hakim Murad, a, a Muslim American, sorry, British scholar. Just, I had a little slip. I wish we could claim him uh, as an American, but he's too smart. He's from the UK. Um, yeah, I think that the, the layeredness as well is what you're mm -hmm. talking about, right? Like that layered experience and going through it over and over and over again. I think there's something that is birthed that's like beautiful out of that. Not only did your comedy get better, but I think you also, like you said, it's like learning how to relate to your audience in different ways. And also some people are like, oh no, I'm gonna stick to my guns and do this thing the way that I wanna do it until you're comfortable with it. I'm gonna make you, I'm gonna continue to make you uncomfortable. I think about George Carlin. I can't imagine George Carlin going up there and being, everyone being like, wow, George, that was amazing. I can, I can imagine people like trying to boycott him, getting yeah. angry, not wanting to invite him, and he's like a f legend. Um, I don't know what your question was, but I wanted to share that. <laughs> I did. You covered it. It's the, the, sh the shadows and the light. And right, the, I said something smart, <laughs> I think that someone else smarter said. I was gonna say something else, I was gonna say something else about that. Yeah. You were, okay, so just in general, I will just say that when we're talking about building like community, community of, of, of people who are self-doubters, <laughs> you know, like I think comedians have, we're fragile and you, you talk about mental health a little bit, but like a lot of us, like you said, like, do you have doubt? That was your question. Like, do you sometimes have doubt? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we are like wildly insecure. <laughs> We're like, please, do you like it? Keep laughing. Do you like it now? How about I do it this way? Will you laugh more? Will you love me? It's like, it's, all, it's like a, this is a dance that we're doing and it's because we are often very insecure. There's lots of doubt. I, I just wanted to have an honest moment here, mm -hmm. just as a Muslim woman who is practicing, who has two young boys, that I'm trying to raise in this world. It is very hard for me sometimes to be in spaces where there is alcohol and drugs 
being consumed and I am like the odd person out, right? Mm -hmm. Like a lot of times those are coping mechanisms and self-medication for people's like very serious issues that they have. So I sometimes doubt whether I'm supposed to be kind of in these, some of the environments. And I always think like, I'm very careful about cussing on stage, although not today. But um, like, if this was on YouTube, I would be careful because I don't want my kids to be like, you just said fuck, fuck, fuck. You know, I can't, I'm like, no, you can't say that. Don't say that word. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so there's just something, there's something I'm negotiating at all times. And you know, you might, you might call it, you know, shame or guilt or regret. You might call it all those things, but I think I, str I struggle personally with that because there's lots of environments that people are gonna write me off w as I walk in, right? Like, like I was saying, like you're sending messages when you walk in and there are comedians, there's like, like I'll get like wholesale written off. And it was amazing to me that comedians of color and, and female comedians were just naturally more open to me being a part of the conversation and like, and other comedians just would write me off. And I have found, I'm gonna be honest, I'm gonna be real right now, the Muslim male comedians don't like me. Hmm. I have no Muslim male comedian friends, except for you, Yazido, I love you, dude. You have one. He's, he's like, he's a, he's a baby, you know, cause he's just coming up. He's like a okay. mentee, right? But he's there like is one, you have I one. Love, I got one. Right. He's a Gen Zer, so of course he's normal. You know, Gen Zers, I swear to you, you guys are amazing. Yeah. So open-minded on everything. Yeah. You know, they're, yeah, they're just like, it's a spectrum, baby, all of it. It's just, <laughs> you know? And we got all these fucking hangups, you know? And so, the, the, I will just say, the established Muslim male comedians have opened absolutely zero doors for me. Hmm. None. In fact, they try to avoid me at all costs because here comes Islam judging their expression, right? And their involvement in environments of self-coping and medication and get, you know, moving forward. They have doors open to them that I'll never will. Mm -hmm. and, but my hope is that Sarah will have a door open. Mm -hmm. Yazido yeah, will have a, a, a door open. This young man will have a door open. You know, and I don't know if you get any love from them or not. They don't give me any love, bro. But there is not one comedian that reaches out to me that I'm like, screw you. Not one. And one of them, she's like this YouTuber. Her name is Tazzy Faye. Now she's making a film. And I had, I had talked to her about stand-up like four years ago. And she's like, I want to cast you in this film. And I'm like, bet. <laughs> so I'm just saying, you never know, like, not being an asshole, what, will, what that will do. But there's, lots of, there's a lot of self-doubt is what I want to say. I think it's part and parcel of this process. And um, I don't know, it's therapy, I guess. It's just therapy, man. There's a line when people have asked me about working here for this long, working with all the talent, and I, I often say that no one got into comedy because they're well-adjusted. <laughs> yeah. Which I think is generally true. But here's the other realization, being a 56-year-old man, is I don't know that any human being is well-adjusted that I've ever met in my life. I mean, you know, as you said, we're all hot messes, and we're all dealing with, with this stuff. Um, and, I'm, and I'm curious, Crystal, you've, I know Katie's heard this term, and I'm assuming you have too, the punching up, punching down yeah. term. Uh, some, some, so in, in, in comedy circles, or in, the people talk about you know, the, that you should never be punching down, you should also, also always be punching up, that if you have a, a certain kind of status or power to make fun of people who are lower in status or lower in power is a bad thing. Generally, I, I actually think that that is, that is true. I'm just curious in, in your travels if that's ever, I mean, because I'm sort of hearing from you that yeah, some people are fine punching down even in your own community. Have, have you come across that? I mean, I think, you know, definitely, I love it. I mean, it is definitely punching up, and I think the majority of our comedians do, but I think sometimes the things that we're con confronted with are just so fucking egregious. Yeah. Right. And, and, and But you also look at relation, relationality and power, and it's not like Native peoples are, like, up lording over a lot of people, right? I mean, we're, we, everything is punching up. Mm -hmm. um, but I do think, uh, yeah, I think there's times where they just, they go for it. Right, with some of the things that we've, we've really had to do. Um, and I think to come back to, I was just really interested to come back to kind of your initial question, right? Is there anything that's sort of off limits, right? Yeah. You know? And I think initially, and I really credit my dear friend, Miss Katie, 
um, for, you know, I, I think I always understood, it was like, yeah, this makes sense, comedy, because this is so a part of who we are as Native people, but being so cautious, right, um, initially about it, and just, I think, being an activist who takes herself far too seriously um, most of the time. And, um, but I think, like, what I saw, and I've just checked them out, Google the 1491s, but it's, it's the first, like, really big Native American comedy group, right? And all of them now are the ones behind Reservation Dogs, hmm. right? Um, and all these other amazing shows and things that are going to start coming out soon um, if we ever get past all these strikes and all kinds of other things. Um, but, you know, I think that they, they did this brilliant play um, that, um, uh, gosh, what is the famous theater up in Washington State or Oregon? God, I'll go come, uh, not Arena Theater. Anyways, but they did a, a play called Between Two Knees. Mm -hmm. And it was like literally the history of like Native people in like a play, like genocide, boarding schools, you know, priests and nuns, assaulting kids. I mean, it just was like, it was like a whole story, but it was comedy, mm -hmm. right? And I just remember this moment of watching this skit and it was about, if any of you, I hope, please also Google about Native American boarding schools. That's, there's actually an active investigation being led by the Biden administration into the United States culpability in religious institutions in taking hundreds of thousands of Native children, putting them into these horrif horrifying institutions, and beating their, the nativeness out of them, right? And I would never forget watching the play where they did this whole, it was like a musical, and it was like really depicting the assault that the, the priests and nuns would do the kids, and including sexual assault, physical assault. But they turned it into this kind of musical comedy skit in this moment, and it was really intense. And I think that was the moment of like, has this gone too far? And it was an audience of like 90% white people and then I think we were like the little native section that got to watch it. Um, and what I appreciated about the element of comedy and music, and it was so absurd in some ways, that it actually, one, was an entry point to that largely native or non-native audience, right, that was kind of conservative to actually allow them to kind of come in and learn a mm -hmm. part of American history most people don't know, right? And for us natives sitting in the audience, it really actually opened the door for us to talk about what has been a, largely a taboo subject in so many of our families because of the abuse and the multi-generational trauma. And I really think that being on this journey from Katie to watching what the 1491s have been able to do, and like if you watch Reservation Dogs, it's that also that layered approach to story and comedy as well. That one minute you, they're doing something so absurd and the next minute they're talking about suicide, but not in a way that feels preachy or like we're kind of pigeonholing, you know, because we're very clear that everybody thinks we're a hot mess, right? And we're just pitiful and, and pathetic. And it's like that multi-layered approach of using comedy and all those things that I just suddenly, all the subjects I thought that we could never really talk about, comedy has actually not only opened the door to invite non-natives in to learn a little bit more about us. And because they, what we learned from our research is that when you start talking to Americans about the Native American experience in this country and all the things that has happened to us, people glaze. They just shut down. And I know that this is, we don't have monopoly as Native people. Any people in you know, communities of color know, right? The minute you start getting into things, people are like, oh, that's too much. I don't want to go there. I don't want to feel guilty. And I think that we've learned through our work that comedy just allows people to start, it's like just spoon feeding them in, pulling them in a little bit more. But the power that it's brought our own people to really actually start to have conversations about mental health. We did a cool, you know, collaboration. Well, and the things that we did with, you know, you're Welcome America, which was a, a comedy collaboration we did with, with uh, Bethany Hall and Miss Katie and, and some amazing comedians. Um, but I just, there's a real power to that that now I think there's nothing that we can't touch, right? And I have seen how effective our comedians have been in just one of the most effective things in shutting Mr. Rick Santorum down and the assholes over there that, at CNN, sorry, was just clowning the hell out of them mm. and watching that and watching that and watching that and how effective that was into actually mobilizing people to where there was finally good action. Can I just add something really quick? So I'm thinking of so many stories just to add on to that, but um, the tail end of what Crystal was saying, so there's, you know, for those of you who follow authoritarian regimes, um, who in your doesn't? Spare time, for those who are interested in that. Um, you know, Don't make eye contact with me, Katie, because that's I did story. not. I messed up. I, I, I saw you do that. Avoiding your... You were distracting me. Um, is, uh, you know, if you look at a pattern, 
when a country either starts to lose its freedom of expression and its freedom of speech, there's a really acute pattern, and I'm a little frustrated that we actually don't write about this in a way that's more than just anecdotal. Um, but when you look at a country that is in trouble in terms of you know, dictators or wannabe dictators or close to, um, there's a pattern in which journalists are threatened, of course, and this is something that we really know intuitively and we know, we, we know this, right? But the next people are comedians. They're always the next people. And so just to go to what Crystal was saying about Rick Santorum, part of what is so valuable about what comedians do as social critique in the face of the most dramatic circumstances, you know, ending your freedoms, is um, they show through satire and through comedy the worst thing that can happen to a, a, a strong man or a wannabe strong man is that you show that you're not scared. And comedy shows that you're not scared. It's deeply, deeply threatening. And so one of the things that I am fond of saying to um, maybe uh, sort of civil society writ large, whenever I encounter people who are still a little skeptical about comedy, I say, well, I mean, you need to look no further than the fact that they're exiled immediately, yeah. right? People who want you to be afraid understand that comedians are powerful. And um, one thing that I'll just add to your dark and light question is, um, oh, and I'll add one other thing to Crystal's thing. So uh, one of the comedians that I work with, actually Yasmin, and I just worked with him, was it last week or two weeks ago? We two just worked ago. on a little thing yeah. together. Yeah. Um, there's a comedian named Corey Ryan Forrester. He's based in northern Georgia, uh, in a part of the country that's known for Marjorie Taylor Greene and the Dukes of Hazard, and uh, and so he lives there. And um, he's a he's a progressive comedian. He he wrote a book called um, The Liberal Redneck Manifesto, and uh, and he, you should look him up. He's very funny. He has this alter ego called the Buttercream Dream. Uh, Leslie Jones, who is my favorite comedian, called other than Yasmin. Holy sh nice crap, catch. yes, um, called him her favorite comedian. Anyway, so um, Corey is, you know, is in LA and New York a lot because of their show business towns and he's really, you know, doing real comedy work, but he lives in the Deep South and he says, you know, when I go into the Deep South, I go into Alabama and Louisiana and Georgia and Mississippi, he says, I know exactly what I'm doing. I know how my accent sounds. I know what I look like. I know that we're already kind of in community with one another, and I know many of them do not think the way that I do. So he says, I've learned enough to understand how to do, you know, if I'm doing an hour set, he'll do about 40 minutes of like, I'm gonna talk about my Mima. I'm from the South too, so I can say that and not make it totally awkward. Uh, <laughs> But, uh, or to, he's like, oh, I tell jokes about how I'm lactose intolerant, you know, whatever, like here's a fart joke. But then three quarters of the way in, he'll hit an anti-racist joke mm -hmm. or an anti-homophobia joke. And he says, by then, I have them. And it's not that I think everybody walks out of the room and has a completely changed mind, but he says, without fail, people will come up to me afterwards and say, you know, I just didn't think of it like that. Hmm. Right? And he said, and I quoted him saying this in my book because I thought it was a memorable way of saying it. Corey Ryan Forrester said, I cannot get you to come to my critical race theory talk in the Deep South, but I really can get you to come to my hour-long comedy show. And I'm going to slip in the same idea. So that's very powerful. Thank you for clapping for that. That felt good. <laughs> I, too, am insecure, Yasmin. No, you're so secure. I'm you're not, so I don't know about good. that. I don't know about that. Later, you can give me compliments. I love you, Professor. Um, but the, but the, just to give people sort of, you know, I'm always fond of giving people, like, language or framework to hang on if you want um, to sort of put these ideas into buckets and if that's helpful for your brain. Um, comedy has always been used for social critique. The original definition of comedy that we know of from Aristotle has to do with the things in our culture that are so grotesque and unjust that they deserve to be lampooned and therefore corrected, sort of the original definition. But comedy is also this idea of play and this idea of civic imagination, the idea that 
we can't entirely build the world that we want to live in if we can't see and feel what it looks like when it's better and when it's different. And sometimes comedy can provide us with that kind of play and hope and optimism and sort of activate the best of us in that way. So, you know, social critique and civic imagination, you're welcome. <laughs> I flipped That's it great. in. So this is perfect in terms of, I do have a kind of a last question. So if our folks who are gonna help us with the Q and A wanna grab the mics backstage, this will be a perfect time. Um, did you see in the news last week uh, about what happened in China? So a joke by a Chinese stand-up comedian that loosely referenced a slogan used to describe the country's military has cost an entertainment firm more than $2 million after it was slapped with enormous fines by authorities and this guy's been blackballed. So I knew about the story and I, I posted it, like scary, uh, and my friend Scott Simon at NPR actually is gonna talk about it this weekend and sort of said, Do you give me your thoughts? which I have here, but before, I'm sort of curious, well, do you want to hear what I, what I wrote? Yeah. yeah, but can I add really quickly, yeah. for those who don't, I, I have also been getting a lot of reporter calls about, about this. this, so I've been following it. What's interesting about this story is um, two years ago, in 2021, there was an explicit crackdown on culture. Um, the, the folks in charge there basically said, we're gonna crack down even more on creative culture. So this was like a slippery mm -hmm. slope. And so it's always interesting for those of us, you know, again, back to if you're watching governance issues, um, it's usually not immediate, right? There's usually a, a little, so this is why it was so dangerous that Donald Trump um, you're adorable. Would you call him an adorable plush? He's a plush adorable orange. orange plush. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, when he, in 2017, kept talking about shutting down Saturday Night Live, yeah. it's the same thing, y'all. Yeah. It's a slow, slippery slope, and if you look at countries that have lost this kind of cultural expression, there are some countries that have taken comedy out completely. It lives underground, by the way. Someday I'll write about that. But um, but taking out comedy completely, it's not, it's not an accident. So this to me was not entirely accidental, although horrifying to, to read its sort of manifest, manifestation. Yeah. Yeah, but yeah. yes, what did you say about it? All right, I don't know if he's gonna use any of this. this is, and it's not too long, but this is what I sent to him. I said, comedy has always been a powerful tool for speaking truth to power. Whether it's a court jester or the satire of Jonathan Swift, Comedians have often provided an effective way to acknowledge the elephant in the room. The problem is when the elephant doesn't want to be acknowledged. There's a reason totalitarian and fascist regimes attempt to silence, silence comedians because they know how powerful their message can be. If you can silence the comedians, you can silence anyone. When I first read about the spine, I was shocked, but after the shock came an uneasy reflection. While I've never felt the sting of censorship in my lifetime, it wasn't that long ago that Lenny Bruce spent time in jail in this very country because of the kind of comedy he was performing in a nightclub in San Francisco. That was 1961. I will also tell you that the most translated editions of my book, Yes And, Lessons from the Second City, are from Asian countries, including a translation in Chinese. I literally approved the artwork last month. The original title of our book was The Revolution Will Be Improvised. Maybe we were onto something before we changed the title. That's good. We'll see what he uses. So, this is scary. It's happening somewhere else, but it's happened here. Oh, it's happened. And happens here. Um, to not so, so dwell in the darkness, because you had a real positive spin on that. But, imagination, Kelly. Well, let's talk about that for, for you two. Like, what, what, you know, what do you take, what's the positive thing you take out of that? What's the, Okay. how do we keep going? Well, okay, so here's a couple things. You know, I'm, I'm Egyptian and Libyan, and I don't know if you know, we got Sisi in there in Egypt right now, Whoa. and Libya has two <laughs> warring governments. It's not a good spot that we're in. Um, but I was, I was thinking about Bassem Youssef and how he was also targeted because really he's following the expression of Jon Stewart, kind of trying to do the same thing in Egypt and the Egyptian government was like, oh hell no, we're gonna kill you, you know? So, you know, he lives in New York and, and he, he is able to kind of um, find freedom here in a country that, like you said, kind of wrestled with this. I think we're seeing it in a different way now with the book bans in these state by state 
book bands of like like poet books of poetry. Like, what's wrong with you? The Bluest Eye? The Bluest Eye by Toni Morrison was the single most influential book of my life, yes. by far. I remember reading it in seventh grade and being like, "It's all a lie." I mean, it was just. It was so important. It was so important for me to read that book and to realize um, that I wasn't alone. And so I think we're just, we're, it's, like, it's like taking companions from people because that's what comedy is. Comedy is companionship. It's like I'm saying, like I'm talking about my life, but you're seeing yourself in me. And so now we're, now we're buddies. Right, and that's why people feel like they could talk to me and be like, "Oh my God, I love that bit." Oh, I did the same thing with my wife. You know, like they can, they, you know, they they have a camaraderie. And so when we take that companionship away, I think we take like real forms of role modeling and real forms of inspiration from the whole future generation, and something that we have to watch out for. And it's about having a civic imagination that's got a sense of humor, <laughs> and is not afraid. Is not so afraid of new ideas or ideas that somehow in your mind run contrary to what, you know, it's like when you, when you censor things, you make them sexier. Yes. That's what I think. Yeah. But Sam Yusuf would not have been a popular, as popular, I don't think, until he got exiled from freaking Egypt. And now it's like, I, you know, I want to meet him. You know, I, I want to meet that guy. So anyways, um, I was just going to say um, one point about uh, like my comedy, right? like what I tried to do on stage. So for example, that white privilege joke that I just did, okay, for you guys, where I was talking about um, this crazy woman, this really happened in a Marshalls. And that joke is, is meant to disarm, so I'm, I'm talking about something else, right? You have no idea where I'm going with that joke. So it's, I have to gain your trust to get you to that last point, right, that last joke. But also, my hope is that there are people in the audience that think, I don't have white privilege, that's freaking crazy. <laughs> but, if they, but if they see me, right, if they see me in their mind that just like things don't compute and I'm like, no, no, bro, like I got white privilege. Then the hope is that that reflects like, oh, I never thought of it that way, right? I never, I never thought of it that way. And it's that opening, that those openings, and I think in a subversive but playful way, and being a little naughty and making you think in a new, different way, I think that's the expansive piece and that's like companionship. So I, I really hope that we don't lose that. And you know, the more bands, I don't know, the more sex, I don't know, you know, I don't know. Ban it all you want, we you're just only gonna wish. make them more popular. We can only hope. Yeah. Crystal, any thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I've been, I had knee surgery a couple of weeks ago, so I have been, like, not watching the news and just, you know, being on some good drugs. No, I'm just kidding. Um, and, uh, You're not kidding. Laying in bed, watching Netflix. So I did not see the news. But I think what's interesting about it is it, it's horrifying, right? It's all the things. But I think we constantly externalize that that's happening over in that, co that country and that authoritarian regime and all of these places where these horrifying, it's happening here. And it just has felt like increasingly since 2016, since the plushy, orange plushy person yeah. came, came into our yeah, lives. Yeah, orange plushy anyway, sounds better. Um, <laughs> that it's been like we're like that frog in the pot of water. And it's just slowly that, that heat keeps turning up, that we just become increasingly more tolerant of the fact that all of these things are getting taken away. Yeah. And that headline that you just read is going to, in a couple years or less, be something that's happening here. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the thing that we really have to understand is it is insane and I'm just kind of watching more and more as people, I think, I think everybody's exhausted. I don't know what it is that we just seem to have a very high tolerance for our rights to freedom of speech, to express ourselves in all kinds of ways, just are going outside the door and like increasingly people are like, okay, but man, I can check out TikTok and you know, other things. And I, I, you know, I even think like, when you saw that Montana's trying to ban TikTok, I was like, and it's so funny because they didn't even use this covert spy that China's trying to get us argument. No, this is really a reaction on the right because if you remember, it was the TikTokers that organized that shut down Trump's big rally in Tulsa, Oklahoma, where I live. They organized and got all the tickets. That's how it all started. They organized on TikTok to get all the K-pop stands or whatever yeah. to go buy up all the tickets. And then when he showed up, no, they were empty seats, right? Mm -hmm. I honestly think that this is like the, the rights, like we're going for TikTok. No, participate. Um, we want to hear you, boo. Keep talking. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, I think all of that's to say is that it's happening here.
yeah. right? Yeah. And, and it's happening all around us right now. And I do think to kind of come back to the whole reason why we're here about the power of comedy, right, is increasingly what I, I see in the work that we do is that people are getting their news from our comedians. Yeah. People are not going and reading the New York Times and the yeah. da 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 da. And certainly, you know, younger people, right? Mm -hmm. Different ways that people are getting their news, they're getting turned on. And, it, and so much of it is comedy. And people are hungry for it. And I love that, you know, the idea of this like Trojan horse, right? Of like three quarters of that set is just like, I'm relating to you and we're falling yes. together. And then I'm going to start hitting you with some stuff. And I think that that's the thing that as, you know, because I'm looking ahead at the next 10 years, we're doing all the analysis about what's coming, and I'm not going to make, you know, like get all depressed and be like, but there's a lot of threats coming, particularly at our community as it, with others, but I'm focused on that. And I think when I think about the investments and where we're going to double down in some of those organizing strategies, it's going to be in comedy and thinking about really different ways, because increasingly we're turning off our ears and our eyes to what is happening around us. But it seems like comedy has a way to keep kind of yes. jarring that door open. And the minute we get up on our soapboxes and start talking about things, everyone's like, whatever. Um, so I think that's, that's really the important thing. And we can't, we can't take it for granted. And this is the moment more than ever that we need to be investing and supporting in the comedians from diverse communities in all kinds of places. Because otherwise, I think, you know, and, and obviously and coupled with organizing and you know, as we think about, you know, civic power and civic imagination about the world we want to be, I think this is going to be such an important strategy within all of the work that we do if this country is going to make it, you know, and we have to kind of keep finding the jarring ways. And I think that's why we also have to really support comedians just like going there and being edgy and, and you know, um, and, and really pushing the boundaries when it does make us uncomfortable because I think we're a little too comfortable in this country right now because we're literally watching our bodies, our rights, everything yeah. go away. Yeah. I mean, oddly enough, I think you can kind of bank on the comedians. I think there's, a, you know, if I'm going to trust the population, <laughs> the young comedians. And I know we have some teachers out there too. All right, Izzy, can we raise the, um, the lights a bit so we can uh, get some questions from the audience? And then see your beautiful faces. Yeah, do we have the folks out there with the microphones? Go for so many. Hi. Oh, God. Okay, I'm nervous. <clears throat> um, hi, this is actually a question for Yasmeen. Um, hi. hi. Um, so I loved how you talked about your non traditional pathway to comedy and performing. Yeah. And about how the pressures of like our community as Muslims like kind of contributed to that and also the misogyny um, of the gatekeeping. <laughs> Um, yeah. My question is, the flip side of that is that there are predominantly white institutions that are very gatekeepy um, in terms of how many Muslims are allowed to access them. Yes. So while you're on stage at one of such institutions, what advice would you give to predominantly white institutions like the Second City who have not had a historically good relationship with people of color and marginalized communities and like very little Muslim representation? Mm -hmm. What advice could you give the gatekeepers yeah. So that that um, like one only one of us, so that that does not have to continue to persist. Yeah. Okay. Go for it. She's hitting below the belt, but I kind of like it. <laughs> it's a little violent, but but beautiful. It's good. You know, I, you know. First of all, I want to say thank you for being here. Thank you for supporting Second City, even when you don't feel that you're always seen here, okay? So thank you. A part of that is that two-way exchange, right? So we have to be open-minded, they have to be open-minded. I think we have to have more, you know, more programming, and I think you just saying that is sending a message, right? Like, there has to be more of us, it's not just one of us, we're, all, we're these like dynamic people, and we have different expressions, and everyone should be welcome. Um, and I think that the, the, the more of us, the more of us there are hitting up those open mics, talking to other friends, writing our pilots, getting out and, and, and shooting it ourselves, that's, you know, we always have to build it. And I think that, um, you know, I'm here to encourage you, I'm here to like support you, but I don't think they're gonna get that message until you keep signing up, right? You have to keep showing up, which is really hard when the doors close, but that's what marginalized communities have done. They kept showing up, it's that persistence that persistence, that is your resistance because you are existing and you're saying, I'm not going anywhere. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for that. 
Next. Well, my question's going to seem very frivolous in comparison. <laughs> but, um, Crystal, you mentioned reservoir dogs and, uh, uh, sorry, what did I say? Reservoir? reservoir. Whatever. Totally different genre? Uh, <laughs> and, Katie, you mentioned uh, that Leslie Jones is your favorite. I was curious if each of you, what is the comedic content that you are consuming right now that is bringing you the most joy? I have um, so my I have teenagers. Woo! It's going great. Um, who has teenagers? Who has teenagers and was like, oh my god? Yeah, it happens suddenly. Anyway, um, but they're ve they have really, really. I really like their comedy taste, and so comedy is one of the things that we do together. We share clips with each other a lot, and like we connect and. Um, I really, I mean, I like lots of, com big fan of um, Reservation Dogs for sure. Uh, I've, I've been enjoying through my kids' eyes as they, okay, now you're gonna judge what kind of parent I am, but anybody who thinks that they can control what their teenagers are watching, I'm, there's no way. Um, so they, I, I really like Big Mouth. Uh, do you all know this? Uh, it's a, Big Mouth is such a great show. Um, you know, I can't remember which no Oh my God, is this going to out me as the worst parent ever? Are you all horrified? Anyway, it's very funny. Do you know this show? Big Mouth. What? Yeah, Big Mouth. Anyway, it's very edgy. It's very edgy, but, but part of what it talks about is like girls, I know, girls and reproductive health issue, and it's really, really funny, and it means a lot to teenagers. Um, I also still, um, I like some of the bits that South Park has been doing uh, lately about some public affairs issues. I feel like they usually kind of nail it. Um, uh, let me see if there's one other, those are, I don't know, that's probably what I, but, you know, I have to watch a lot of comedy for like the Yes and Laughter Lab and other things, so I'm really enjoying watching comedy that uh, comedians are creating from scratch that you haven't necessarily seen in the marketplace yet. So I, I actually just got back from a, um, we hold this thing that's, kind of, oh, yes, I mean, now we call it Y'all Camp. Oh, I like it. Uh, where we bring these like home. amazing comedy fellows together to um, real, like create community and work on their stuff. Uh, and uh, I just, got back from a weekend of watching the most incredible comedy that hasn't been made yet about issues that range from racial justice to trans visibility, um, you know, climate justice. Um, I'm trailing off here. Now I'm so nervous that I said okay. big mouth and you all are gonna be- No, no, it was me. I, I, I'm a hater. A great I'm a show. hater. It was me, it was my face. They were laughing at my face. It was you? I hate big mouth. No way. I hate that Kroll guy. I don't like that guy. Oh my God, he sucks. Sorry. I don't like him. I don't like him. I saw him live. He just sucks. I don't have been the rest I'm so of the sorry. night convincing I'm so sorry. I just don't like it. I don't like the writing. I think it's bland. But, but. I'm gonna send you a clip. Okay, as soon as we me. get back But like the stuff about reproductive, convince I'm gonna you. like that. I like women. Okay, so I was just gonna say, I really, I, I like Roy Woods Jr. Everything that Roy Woods yeah. says, everything that Roy Woods Jr. says brings me joy. It brings me so much joy. Um, I love Leslie Jones. I could just watch her forever, just cussing at her TV. Um, I could just do, I could watch that all the time. Uh, Zainab Johnson is just one of my absolute favorites. She's just a killer. Um, everything she talks about, everything she talks about is funny. Um, and I like Andy Tillman. I've been watching a lot of this Appalachian woman named Andy Tillman. She is flipping hilarious. She's just like, hey guys, hey. And she's always like that church lady. Or Did she's you so, watch she's the, Bapti the Baptist lady? The Baptist one? lady is so good. And the aunt that's always late to church. That's good. It's all good. What, anything that's bringing you joy, Crystal? You seem like a joyful soul. <laughs> You've been doing a lot of drugs, so you're enjoying. I have been doing. I'm like, you I can't enjoy remember the last three weeks. Because you so partake. No yeah. um, no, I think adding on to everything that you say, like one of the, somebody that brings me a ton of joy in his entire, like, just everything he's created is Taika Waititi. And yeah. a lot of people do not know that he's Maori. 
What's he's he? amazing. He's Maori and Jewish. And I mean, also so anything. Cute. Taika Waititi. Uh, and so he, um, oh my God, I'm like, I, by the way, I took a red eye last night and didn't sleep. So I'm like really trying to, str I'm trying, struggling to find my words right now. Um, but what is the film? Uh, Jojo Rabbit. One of my all time favorite, like heartbreaking and also funny and amazing. We are in the shadows, right? Tyke is an executive producer and kind of guest stars every once in a while on it. Um, and then there's another great show that he and his compadres did out in New Zealand. It's like Paranoial, Paranormal 911 show. It's just, Iron it's Blake. so silly and ridiculous and just everything he does is so absurd. And so um, I was just saying he's getting ready to come out with a new project. And he's also the co-executive producer of Reservation Dogs. Oh, so cool. And so when you really look at him and Sterling Harjo, they're just, they're geniuses, honestly. And it's just such a beautiful, comedic, you know, creative partnership between the two of them. Um, and, and I think it's just such a big testament to why that, that show is so good. And then other than that, there's just not enough native content. Like, I love native comedians. And so I spent a lot of time trolling Instagram. Um, just a star to watch really is Janice Meeting from Rutherford Falls. Um, yeah. And she plays amazing characters on, on Reservation Dogs, uh, the, like the rugged auntie and, you know, the, 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 the crabby, you know, receptionist at the medical center, you know, and all the other things. Um, she's one of my favorites, um, along with um, Bobby Wilson, too. So, you, but right now, there's hopefully, you know, we're going to start seeing more of them soon. So, amazing. Great. Other questions? Right here. Yeah. I got the mic, yay. <laughs> OK. Uh, so thank, thank you all for this so far. Our dis the discussion today on the power of comedy has focused on one form of comedy, which is stand-up comedy, like with the brilliant Yasmin. Everyone, give it up for Yasmin. Yeah. <laughs> That's my cousin, and thank you. <laughs> I, I just found out today, but okay. <laughs> but we've also talked about comedy in other contexts, right? So like, Crystal, you just mentioned Jojo Rabbit. We could talk about something as touchy as uh, what's happened, what happened in Germany, but approach it through something funny, right? And then Katie, you also talked about how, how it can be woven into so many different forms. So for, um, I'm gonna pose this first to Yasmin and then also to Katie. Of course, you're know, welcome, Crystal, if you'd like to join in, which is, how would you choose, if you're a producer, if you're making creative content, how would you say, okay, this would work well with stand-up comedy versus weaving it into something, let's say, like academic discourse or uh, like cross-cultural storytelling? How would you know what works better with pure stand-up comedy versus comedy plus? First of all, I like that you're taking notes. <laughs> you got your laptop out, you got your hat. You're just a professor and I like it. Um, <laughs> He needs an internship. Hook it up, Katie. He's a family member. Um, he's not. He's from South Asia. I'm from Africa, guys. We're a different continent. Anyways, um, so first of all, thank you for the brilliant question. Um, so you're asking about the medium, right? Like, how do you actually choose the medium? You want, to, you want me to be like, I'm going to be like totally honest with you. Really, really good work is work that you know. Okay, so when they say like write what you know, do what you know, perform what you know, if you suck at stand up, that is not the right medium, right? Like that's not what you know, that's not a natural thing for you. So it might be that you speak to other producers who produce similar kinds of content, especially if you're doing something outside of your lane, right? It's always good to create a community of comedians or a community of people who are creatives. And I love like writing collectives for that, right? If you can join a writer's room, if you can join an accountability group to help with the writing, those are all like great ideas. Like you can bounce out, bounce people, you know, bounce it off of other people who've done things before you. And that's what the y'all uh, community is about. That's what the Yes and Laughter Lab is about, so you should apply. But anyways, what I was gonna say is that um, I, that's, that's my answer to you. I, I, would not, I, I would not do an improv group. Yeah, even though I'd, be, I, I'd love to do, I need to learn it. You know, um, that's probably not going to be the right medium for me, but stand-up is going to be natural or, or storytelling is going to be natural. I, I think about that a lot when I'm thinking about, I want to write a TV pilot. And so I'm, a, I'm already in talks with another creative partner who's like, who writes in that world, you know? So I'm not going to go out and try to like <laughs> go in the kitchen and be like, I'm going to throw everything in this pot. You know, I got to go and talk to the, like the chef. Like, how does that, how does you make this work? So I, I would just say like, lean on your partnerships. You don't have to do it alone. And in fact, you're going to make it better. I think um, when you when you look to your creative partners, 
I'm actually going to pipe in and just because we, we do produce, right? Whether it's social justice campaigns, we're producing, you know, things for, you know, YouTube or now we're getting into TV and film. The thing that I've learned the most is to trust the creative and just to get out of it instead of saying this should be, because I'm not a comedian, I'm not funny, I don't know, I don't know half the things you're asking me here. I'm like, oh my God. Um, well, that's on me. <laughs> Where's my glossary over here? No, I'm just kidding. Um, but I've actually just learned as we get into producing and we, you know, oftentimes it's like, we, there's a problem. There's a problem that we want to address. There's something that we want to call attention to. And what I've learned successfully, and part of this has been through the partnership with Katie, right? Because she, she was the one that dragged me into a room of comedy writers and said, show them the research and then they're going to kick you out of the room for like four days. And then you're going to see what they create. And I think that's when I really learned, trust them. Right, and I think through that process, whether it's you know comedians collaborating or it's one or whatever, they just instinctually know because it goes to your point about what are they good at or whatever. And I just think you just have to really trust them and the process. Yeah, the only thing I will add is um, it really is true that some comedy people are very good at one genre and not another. Yeah, it's really yeah. true. I'm thinking of one, and I, Kelly Leonard is the real expert on this, so I kind of want you to also answer it, but there's a, somebody I was thinking of immediately as you were asking that question, I'm gonna leave this anonymous, um, a really brilliant character comedian, and I watched this person do stand-up, not funny at all, but a hilarious uh, front-facing comedy um, character person, and it's really interesting how that doesn't necessarily translate. I mean, so that's just one answer to your question. And I feel like, uh, you know, I feel like part of why you might be asking this, maybe you are a comedian, but um, this is why that process of trying and trying really matters. Because if you're killing it with your characters and not stand up, you might know that maybe that's not your thing. Um, but it also has to do with what kind of writer you are, right? I mean, this is where I really do actually want Kelly to weigh in too. Um, if you're a writer who can imagine seasons and seasons of characters and arcs and stories like Sterling Harjo, you're probably writing an episodic television project. But if you're someone who gets up and uh, is, you know, it's just it, different ways of knowing that. But I, I think one of the things that Kelly Leonard says, I guess I'll quote you right in front of you, is uh, not practicing comedy without a license. I really love that idea. It's the idea that we're all, you know, we're all a little bit funny, or we have like a funny person in our family. I like to say I'm a, not a professional funny person, but I'm a funny professional per I'm a very funny professor. Um, a very I actually nutty really professor. am. But, uh, but the idea that just because we're funny, doesn't mean I can't go write a television comedy pilot. I can write a book, but I can't write a TV pilot because I'm not a comedy writer. So it's that importance of practicing, 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 honing the craft, taking it really seriously. No comedian gets good at the writing or the performing without doing it a ton, right? Yeah. Do you have anything to add, Kelly? The only thing I'll add is, um so my wife runs the first ever BA in comedy writing and performance from Columbia College. So every parent's nightmare. Um, <laughs> and she just sent in her second book to Northwestern Uni University Press and it's called Funnier. And the reason it's called Funnier is because at the open houses, the parents will come up and say, hey, are you gonna make my daughter or son funny? She goes, I can't make them funny, I can make them funnier. Oh, I love that. Taking the thing that they have, yeah. finding out how to do that the best way possible, and that might be stand-up, and it might be writing, yeah. and it might be something else. Yeah. Um, but like, you discover the medium that works for you, or, and I think this is the thing that m she certainly teaches, what she calls comedy cross-training. Because you don't know where you're gonna end up. Oh, awesome. At this point, right, yes. you might end up in a writer's room, yes. someone might just want your voice, and yeah. then you're gonna have to figure that shit out. Yeah. No pressure. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Uh, let's do one more question. Right, okay. Right here. I've, I've got the mic, so I guess it's not. <laughs> Make it a good one. This is the last one. Oh, shoot. Such pressure. Well, I want to first say thank you to all of you for sharing who you are and your vulnerability and your courage and making us laugh because laughing does matter. 
and it's so important what you do um, for those of us who are part of BIPOC or the lesser included folks, you speak to us very well. The question I have in this world that we're in now with the divisiveness that you've talked about, and you spoke some of this, um, Yasmin, with expanding your, your comedy, how do you work towards being more inclusive of the plush world, of the MAGA world, of the people that don't think like we do, and also of acknowledging that in this very room, not everybody would label themselves a left-wing liberal, right. even though they may all care about human rights. Yeah. And so how do we work towards being truly inclusive, melting the divide? I'm wondering if in the, what is the name of the, Come all y'all or y'all group? Yes and Laughter Lab, y'all. The y'all, yes and Laughter Lab. Oh, this is wonderful, y'all. Gender inclusive and friendly. <laughs> if we get some of the folks, because in rooms across the country, people are laughing, but they're laughing at different things. So do we have a way of bringing the comics together, the comedians together, to talk about these hard issues? Do we get some of the folks on the other side from Plush World, and I like Plush World plush much better than mine. Really from it's Plush it's, World. It sounds like Juice World, but Plush yeah, World. Yeah, yeah. Oh, no, like, but I juice want that to be a rapper. A guy. Careful, that's I want to be a rapper snappy. named Plush World. <laughs> no, but, but, no, but Plush World, I love that. Yes. <laughs> what do we do to make sure that we're being truly inclusive and making laughter that we can all laugh at because we need the comic relief yeah. in the world we're living in. Yeah. It is a fantastic question that people like Katie, that, that is like she is investigating that question, just so you know. And we're on, we work on projects together just about what you just said. How in the world do you cross lines? With people, you probably I probably should stop saying white people. That would be better for me. But you know, it's just hard because they're there, and um, you know. I mean, they're everywhere. They're ever, they're right there. Look at that, just, just literally staring at me. And I got one. I got one at home that just like right there. So, anyways, but um, I I was just gonna say that um, <laughs> in general. In general, I think there are certain themes that appeal to people, right? So for example, and, and this is hard because we're, we're trying to walk the line. We're not trying to water it down. Then it's boring. You said it beautifully. Everyone likes hot tea. Some people like cold tea. Everyone hates warm tea, right? Like he said, I happen to like warm tea, I would just like to say, but, but um, how, how do you straddle this line? How do you balance what you say to not alienate people, but to, to reach them? And the only way that I would answer that question is kind of like what I was saying before, like the more specific you get to your life, the more specific you really get into like, what has an emotional response for me? The more likely you will hit, it, it's like an arrow into someone else's life w without expecting it because we're all human beings, right? We all get upset that our husbands Breathe like that. Like, why? Oh. oh my God, just cut the breathing. We're all there. So if we could just get into the base, just like so, right? If we could just get to the base, like the base of it. I think the, the more primal you go, the better, right? The better, the more like, Did I can't. just come together on I know, I, babe. We come together a lot, but I, I'm just saying, I think, I think that's the way you get it. If you can, even if you cut politics out, there's some really great comedians that don't talk about anything political. One of them is, we just talked about, was Nate Bergazzi, yeah. right? Nate's a, he, he, he has a special called Tennessee Kid. He's vanilla, you know? It's a vanilla situation, but it's very good. It's extremely well written. It's relatable on some levels. You know, it's good. It's good. It's like it's good. Or or Jim Gaffigan talking about donuts or hot pockets. Like we're all going to relate to some. There's some comedians that have the ability to do that. I think they're very. That's like there's more power 
in harnessing that kind of thing, whether that be in, in um, c comedy fest or comedy shows that are open to everybody and that you have to be almost intentional to invite these mixed audiences and that's what me and Katie talk about. You have to be intentional about bringing like that show to Tulsa, Oklahoma. Or you gotta be really intentional like, I'm going to Huntsville, Alabama, I'm gonna do a damn show, I'm gonna do the damn thing. So I, that's what I will just say, I'll just answer you by, by, by saying, I think the, the deeper you go, I, and, and the more specific you get, you will become so universal that you will capture people whether they like it or not. They're gonna, they've been, they all watch the Hot Pocket commercial, so they got it, you know? It's like, yeah, insert Hot Pocket into the toilet. Yeah, 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 I got it, you know? Sorry, did I go too far? Okay, um, I'll bring it back, I'll bring it back. But yeah, I'll let, I'll let Katie, I think, I feel like you would have a good answer to that question. Well, I feel like you, Answered it beautifully. I'll just uh, I'll just add that I think it's really intentional work to not be overtly partisan political in one's comedy. It's really, really it's actually difficult and it's a choice. Um, there are some comedians who really do it well. Um, I'll give maybe one example of I, I don't even know if she would agree with my characterization, but let's try. Um, actually, Yasmin and I really are working on a project on this exact thing. Yeah. So yeah. hopefully we'll hopefully we'll nail it. Um, we're producing a show that's about um, bringing people together, not to talk about political issues, but to talk about shared values, and it's all about play, actually. It's truly yeah. about play. Yeah. It's, it's about play, comedic play almost more than it is about jokes, yes. like set up and jokes. Like, and so um, who I was gonna mention here as someone who I think does a great job at this, and again, I don't know if she would agree that this is her intent, but I think so. Um, there's a comedian named Nagin Farsad. Um, she's on NPR a lot. Um, sometimes she hosts Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me. She's really good at that. Um, but Nagin Farsad is a really brilliantly talented comedian. She does stand-up, but she made a film in... Uh, I'm going to get the year wrong, but it was... Um, I believe it was a couple years after 9-11. Uh, and her, she, uh, John Stewart, executive produced the documentary. It's called The Muslims Are Coming. Um, but what's funny about this film is the little comedic stunts that she, it's a documentary, so you're watching her and another comedian basically cross the country and put on shows and basically do sort of comedic stunts. But the comedic stunts are all like, hey, how are you? I'm Nagin, what are you up to? And she has this one stunt um, that I'm particularly fond of, I teach with it. Uh, I don't do, I show the clip of her doing it, um, where she goes to Alabama and she sets up a table with like ridiculous prizes and it's game play. And she says, um, step right up and tell me if this piece is from the Old Testament, the New Testament, or the Quran. Yes. And it's really, really funny and very charming. And you see all kinds of people like, one guy's like, well, I'm a deacon in my church, so I'm definitely get that, gonna get that right. He does not get it all right. So, and to, for anyone who does not understand the subtext of that, the entire point was to say, look how little understanding we have about each other, you know, without ever saying it, right? And, uh, and it's very funny and it's charming and it's not political with a capital P, but for sure it is about you know, common uh, ignorance yeah. and misunderstanding, but also about just playing together. And I'm sure Nagin had all kinds of feelings about really doing that work, um, but the play was the thing. And so I, I, I think it's hard and intentional, but it can be done. And the one thing that I'll add here is that sometimes I bristle a little bit, not from your question, by the way, I think your question was great. But the idea that comedy necessarily must fall into a binary of either right or left, I actually disagree with that. Some of it does, some of it does. But the idea that, you know, if, a, if a, you know, the, the idea that, you ha that you're picking a side necessarily and that's the only place that you can go with it. I think punching down is punching down. Punching down can happen no matter how you vote. Punching down the, the sort of definition and idea of that is poking fun at uh, people with less power. Not punching up is poking fun at institutions of power. There's lots of ways, you know, um, groups and institutions can hold power. But um, so I think it's really possible, and I think that's the biggest challenge. It's actually something that we're working on the most 
at our organization is the idea of truly using comedy for kindness and civic, building civic fabric together. And I don't see actually how to do that if we go with politics with a capital P because, I mean, there's a lot of research that shows that satire that's too ideologically polarized sends people further into their ideological camps and then we've made it worse, right? So. It's, a, it's an important challenge, and I think it always is a question that should be asked because of how difficult it is and how much comedy can be a superpower in exactly that way. Thank you. Crystal? Yeah, I mean, I think, yes, 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 these two amazing women um, on either side of me, and I think, you know, I, there are moments, like, I love the idea. It is sometimes putting just people in a room, and I remember when we did the comedy think tank, there was, what was that, Sebastian? Oh, yeah. Conley? From St uh, Connelly. Yeah. Canelli, yes. Like, kind of, kind of seemed like a MAGA guy, like a bit. Like, and I mean, and he was like on the res, coming to Oklahoma, and like throwing him in. And I remember all the native comedians like, who, who did you all bring into this room? And they got locked in the room over four days. And man, everybody, it just. They, by the time they came out, like the native comedians, they were all collaborating with Sebastian to do their own show together, yeah. right? And it was magic. And they actually, some of the ideas that came out of that were like some of the best ones. Was the yeah. collaborations with with Sebastian and, and getting it. Um, and so I think that's part of it. I mean, I think it's kind of the Trojan horse part, like the comedian you reference, like three quarters of the way in, you kind of, you know, kind of flip the perspective. But I will tell, I'm going to say something that's probably going to be very unpopular. But I, because, you know, I am every day living as an organizer and making decisions about creative content and what we're, what we're putting out, depending on the issues that we're working on. And I think that we've learned that in terms of an investment, and I'm talking from, you know, as an organizer, I'm not going to worry about them. Because they're not going to move. It's there. I, you know, if I've got resources, right, and all the things, I am I'm not going to like spend our time and our precious resources and, and the people we're working organizing with to figure out how I'm going to move this group over here. That every day I'm waking up and seeing it now. But when investing in something with these universal themes, that it's just funny. It's, there's universal things about our humanity, our values, and all the things, and I do, and I think sometimes it is poking fun, that sometimes in those quieter moments, like, yeah, that is a little ridiculous, that you might be able to move them over, but that's been an actually a very intentional choice that we at Illuminative have made, because we went and did the research and looked at the demos about who is most likely to support Native peoples and to sign up and to be a part of, of what we are, we are fighting for. And that group was not showing up, so, but bonus, if we see some of them come across because it's just really good stories, really good content, and really good campaigns we're putting out there. How about this panel? Thank you, everyone. Thank you to the MacArthur Foundation and Pillars. Thanks for coming out. Have a safe drive home. Thanks to our servers, too. Thanks to your servers. Take your servers.